Hello Church, my name is Lily Sanger and I am here to tell you about this week's story of Joseph. We have covered 50% of the Joseph story and this is where it really starts to get fun. Up until now, Joseph's story has been about when life gets tough and we go through hard things. We all know it is very easy to react badly when those things happen to us, especially when we aren't the cause of those hard times. What we are learning from Joseph's life is that God always has a plan for those hard times and we have the freedom to choose to respond with faith and prepare ourselves to be successful in God's economy. Everyone wants to be successful in school, sports, jobs, and with family. It is fun to be good at some think and be rewarded. Everyone just finds success differently. Sometimes a lot of money, cool stuff, and fun vacations, and being popular make people feel successful. But according to Jesus, when we find our purpose and do it, that's success. It begins with having a personal relationship with Him, and then the fun stuff starts. We learn why we were born and start to live a life that God created for us, on purpose. Joseph found out why he was created and why all the bizarre things happened to him, and he was successful. But he learned that God keeps score a little differently than we do. Let's hear from Pastor. This week. So we've rounded the corner in the Joseph story and we're heading toward home. Just a couple of weeks left. And I want to remind you of a passage from Romans, Romans 15, 4. The Apostle Paul says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. The endurance of the stories of the people like Joseph gives us encouragement and provides hope. A couple of things I want you to think about or be thinking about as we kick off this part of the story today. And we're going to be in a parable of Jesus before we get to the story of Joseph. It's really exciting. And I think that you'll see in comparing opposites that, um, man, it really makes a point. But let's look at a couple things, a couple statements. Are you viewing your life as to when you become successful, then you will decide to honor God? that when the next stage comes, when the next relationship, the next promotion, the next graduation, the next retirement, then you'll follow God, then you'll be faithful? Or are you viewing your life as while you are becoming successful in God's eyes, not in man's eyes, I will be faithful, whether I'm at a high or a low or somewhere in between? What's my responsibility to God? What am I doing to be part of God's plan? Do you view your life as a ministry? Do you view your relationships, your job, your friendships, your neighborhood, your family as intentional? Perhaps God has put you there on purpose and for a purpose as part of his kingdom plan that you're here to make a difference and to leave something behind you that points toward Jesus with every step you make throughout this life. If you believe that, then I think you're on the right track. If not, then I hope to change your mind. I wanna show you a story, a parable that Jesus talked about that gives us the opposite of what success looks like. It talks about the un-Joseph. It's a great story. It's a story you and I have talked about two different times in different ways. And we're gonna talk about it again because it's one of these watershed moments. Jesus is talking at this point to thousands of people. And people are listening to him, people who want to follow him, people who are disinterested in him, people who are somewhere in between, people conspiring to kill him, and, and some who are really on fire and just wanting to live their lives and learn more. And he's teaching them, and he's teaching them a couple of things. He says, one thing that can destroy your life is religious hypocrisy, is trying to look better than other people. It's trying to, to be good at religion and put others down and to show everybody how you can follow the rules. And he said, another thing that can really kill you in life is pursuing stuff is trying to win and accomplishing everything you set out to accomplish but realizing that you really got nothing in return and then some guy just hops up at random in the middle of Jesus teaching it would be kind of like I'm teaching you and one of you just hops up and goes hey Rick when are we going to lunch I mean it would be that sort of disconnected and random and it would distract me a little bit but it didn't distract Jesus he hops up and he just says something now I want to show you Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, the inheritance he's talking about most likely was an inheritance that was passed from the father to the oldest son. 
And the oldest son's responsibility wasn't to hoard the inheritance, but to make sure that the rest of the family was taken care of, to divide it, to give it out, to employ people, to be responsible. And somehow this was a family dispute or a squabble. And Jesus looks at him and he says, who made me judge over you? Now we know Jesus judges, right? I mean, God's gonna judge whether or not we know Christ and whether or not we spend eternity in heaven. But Jesus said, essentially, who made me judge Judy in your life? Why would I worry about being part of the people's court? This isn't me. It's not what I was called to do. Then he said to him, watch out. Now, watch out is a military term. This is actually a military phrase, and it means to, to take watch. It means to, like if you're watching a military movie and there's enemy that are, are encroaching on your camp and you're told to be on first watch, to stay up the night and make sure no one sneaks up. What happens if you're not watchful? Well, bad things happen. People can infiltrate the camp or you could be fired or removed from your service, discharged dishonorably. Watch out because somebody will get you. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. There's more to life. The vision of your life should be more or about more than stuff, than promotions, than accumulation, that there's more, that God has called you to more. And if it's not about more, it's so, so much less. So then Jesus told him a story. Now the story is a parable, and a parable is a story that's laid alongside a point. The parable is a story that didn't really happen. The point is a story or a point that's very true. It's absolutely true and it's in scripture. So Jesus really told the story, but he made this story up to illustrate a point. And he says, there's a certain or the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Now it's very interesting that he uses the uh, agricultural language or he uses an agricultural reference because we live in an agricultural state. And so I want you to think about this and I want you to think about the seasons and I want you to think about planting season and harvest season and growing season. And I want you to think about who controls the seasons. You can't make the wind blow. You can't make the sun rise. You can't make the temperatures suitable for growing. I can't bring the rain. I have no control over an abundant harvest. And you say, well, good news, I'm not a farmer. But I want to suggest to you that in the seasons of our lives, you and I have no control over the things that allow us to be successful except being faithful in what we can control. What can't we control? Where we're born? the families we have, the educational opportunities that arise, the people who God brings into our lives, the circumstances that change and can change everything, the intelligence that God gives us, the aptitude to be able to work, the strength of a person's back. We control none of that. In the seasons of our life, God controls all of the billions of contingencies, the variables, allowing a person who works hard and is faithful with what we have to find success. But the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Now count how many times he says he or I or refers to himself. I counted 11, this is the NIV, you may count differently. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to put all my stuff. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. The more he gathered, the more he accumulated, the more he was successful in the eyes of the world, the more he wanted to focus on himself. And so he got to a point, taking credit for what God had done, where he said, now I can coast. 
I don't have enough room in my garage, so I need a storage unit. Well, I don't have enough storage units, so I'm going to buy more storage units. I have to have more space for my stuff. I have to have more places for my trophies. I have to have more. And, and he kept building, and he kept growing, and he, kept, and he had this empire. And, and he was so happy, and he was so proud of himself. And then God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you then who's going to get everything you've worked for? This is how it will be with whoever focuses on this world, storing up things for themselves, but is not generous and rich toward God. There are three things that characterize this man, the anti-Joseph. I said that, the Bible didn't say it. This is Rick making comparisons, but I think you'll see how perfect these comparisons are. Three things that characterize them. Number one, he believes he is responsible for his own success. And Jesus called him a fool. I want to remind you the things that we don't control that allow us to be successful. Our opportunities, the people we meet, our aptitude, and so on and so forth. God allows and controls the seasons in our lives. We do our best with what we have to thrive in the circumstances that God put us in. But he allows for it to work. And God defines success a little differently than we do. This man believes that he is his own smartest counsel. He says, I asked myself, I consulted with myself, I said to myself, no one else knows what I should do. No one's as smart as me. This is my life. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. This man, he believes that his time and his relationships and his money are his own, and he's not accountable to anyone. And Jesus said to him, you're a fool. Now, fool means a little, something a little different in Jesus' day than it does in our day. It means misinformed, a person who's bought into the lie of the world, a person who's acting without all of the information, a guy who's playing a game he wants to win, and when he wins, he finds out he really loses, who gets to the end where he can focus on himself and congratulate himself to take it easy, accountable to no one, and instead of finding the satisfaction that he thought his soul would have, finds that he's empty with regret. Responsible for his own success. He's his own smartest counsel. He's accountable to no one. And Jesus says, you're missing the point. So we'll turn the page. Actually, we'll go back a bunch of pages to the life of Joseph and look how Joseph did the opposite. Listen with me, if you will, to the scriptures from the story this morning. Genesis 41. I dreamed a dream, Pharaoh told Joseph. Nobody can interpret it, but I've heard that just by hearing a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered, Not I, but God. God will set Pharaoh's mind at ease. Your two dreams both mean the same thing. God is telling you what he is going to do. Seven years of plenty are on their way to Egypt, but on their heels will come seven years of famine, leaving no trace of the Egyptian plenty. So Pharaoh needs to look for a wise and experienced man. Their job will be to organize it during the years of plenty. This way, the country won't be devastated by the famine. This seemed like a good idea to Pharaoh and his officials, so he asked them, Isn't this the man we need? Are we going to find anyone else who has God's Spirit in him like this? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but no one in Egypt will make a single move without your stamp of approval. After this, Joseph oversaw the entire country of Egypt. He was only 30 years old when he went to work for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. As soon as Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he began his work in Egypt. During the next seven years of plenty, the land produced bumper crops, just as he had said. Joseph gathered up the food of the seven good years in Egypt and stored the food in cities. In each city, he stockpiled surplus from the surrounding fields. Joseph collected so much grain, it was like the sand of the ocean. 
he finally quit keeping track. Joseph and his Egyptian wife Asana had two sons born to them before the years of famine came. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, which means forget, saying, God made me forget all my hardships and my parental home. He named his second son Ephraim, which means double prosperity, saying, God has prospered me in the land of my sorrow. Then Egypt's seven good years came to an end, and the seven years of famine arrived, just as Joseph had said. This was not limited to Egypt. All nations suffered from famine. Egypt was the only country that had bread. When the famine spread throughout Egypt, the people called out in distress to Pharaoh, calling for bread. He told the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, do what he tells you. As the famine got worse all over the country, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold emergency supplies to the Egyptians. The devastation from the famine was severe. Soon the whole world was coming to buy supplies from Joseph. So we see Joseph's life having taken a turn for the better. We see that he had been through some terrible stuff, as you've been tracking for the last few weeks. He was born into a family that was a little dysfunctional, a dad who was a believer, who was a person of faith, but not perfect. Brothers who had um, some questionable hobbies and treated him in ways that weren't great, uh, kidnapped him, beat him up, threw him in the bottom of a well, left him for dead, decided to sell him instead of uh, leaving him for dead, found himself in slavery, sold to Potiphar, he found himself rising to a level of leadership in Potiphar's home. Then he was accused of a crime he didn't commit, raping Potiphar's wife, thrown into prison where he interpreted two dreams for a baker and a cupbearer. The baker's dream didn't end so well. The baker ended up being impaled. His head was cut off. I mean, it was bad, kind of a bad situation. The cupbearer restored to his position. Joseph wanted to be remembered by the cupbearer. The cupbearer forgot him for two years. Pharaoh had two dreams, and the cupbearer said, I remember a guy who can interpret dreams, and Joseph came onto the scene. I can't interpret dreams, but God can. This is what God means. And Pharaoh said, you're the guy. You are now second in command. You are in charge of Egypt. The only person who's going to be more powerful than you is me. Now, let me read it to you. Now, you hear it, which is important. I'm going to read it to you and you can see it. I'm skipping through some of this. And then I want to just draw some conclusions today and contrast and compare Joseph's life to the life of this fool who Jesus talked about and we just read about from the New Testament. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command and people shouted, make way for the important guy. Make way for Joseph. It was a big deal in town like a police, uh, you know, someone, an escort of cops and cop cars in front of you and you driving behind and in the tinted windows, the Escalade, you know, with the armor piercing and the flags and armor plated and you get the picture. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plenty. Now the land produced plenty. Do you see a similarity between this and the parable that I read to you? The land produced plenty. Who controlled the land and the production of the plenty? God. God controlled the seasons. God controlled the blessing. Joseph was there to be a steward of what God had created and what God had, had offered. Now, Joseph didn't become good at what he did overnight. He became good at what he did and faithful through the hard times in life, through the ups and the downs. He learned management supervisory skills in slavery and in prison. He learned character, and I'm getting ahead of myself, when character wasn't required. He finds himself in charge, but God brought a period of abundance because God controls all of the contingencies in life. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, so much that he had to build bigger barns. Like the sand of the sea, it was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond their ability to measure. But instead of saying to himself and congratulating himself, self, you're successful, self, you've done well. I need no one else to tell me what to do. I'm gonna keep for myself. I'm gonna sell and, and hoard the money for myself. I'm gonna be successful so that I can coast. Joseph did the opposite. The seven years of famine began and just as Joseph said, there was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt, there was still food. 
When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food and Pharaoh told all of the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do exactly what Joseph tells you. Now, here's what I think. Three things that I see. This is what I think that God, well, his definition of success. Because we can be successful in a pit. We can be successful in a prison. We can be successful if we find ourselves second in command. These are three things that I see in Joseph's life. The first thing that I see in Joseph's life, certainly lacking him a life of the fool, is an accountability. He clearly viewed his life. He saw himself as having a significance in something or for something bigger than himself. And because of that, he had a responsibility. He had a responsibility to God and he had a responsibility to the people he was around. He viewed his life differently. He literally marched to the beat of a different drum and he didn't have to. So that reminds me of the question that I ask you as we begin. How do you view your life? How do you see yourself? Well, not only did Joseph have sort of a sense of accountability, but he had a humility about him. And a humility isn't thinking less about yourself. Oh, I wish I was taller. Oh, I wish I was skinnier. Oh, I wish I was richer. Oh, I wish I had a better this. I wish I could speak better. Oh, I'm so bad. Oh, I'm so, that's not humility. That's just another form of ego. Humility is thinking about yourself less often. It's not trying to compare yourself to the other people who are around you. It's not trying to worry about whether you look better or more spiritual than someone sitting next to you or your kids have a little better life than the person who, you know, you may be your friend or, or your frenemy. It's not about your house or about your car or about your job or about your bank account. It's not about trying to compare, looking at everyone else as an adversary. It's about realizing that we're all on the same team and that we take each other by the hand and that winning is all of us getting together and going and finding what it is that God wants for us to do and doing it. That I'm not the star of my own story. That the point of life is not to accumulate so that I can spoil myself and congratulate myself. That the point of my life is to be a blessing to others and to find God's purpose and to do it. The third thing I see in Joseph's life, not only did he have a sense of accountability, not only did he have a sense of humility, this is where, man, this is like the secret sauce. He had an integrity about him that just made him trustworthy. The kid's in a pit. And by the way, he didn't want to be in the pit. The kid's a slave. Wrong. An injustice. He was a victim. But he lived his life even though no one was looking for him as everyone was looking. More importantly, he lived his life because he knew God was looking. And he showed himself trustworthy. Interesting side note, maybe not spiritual, just interesting. Joseph found himself second in command three different times, right? Second in command in Potiphar's household, second in command in the prison, second in command in Egypt because he wasn't first. Ultimately, he lived for an audience of one. There was an accountability about him to God and to others. A humility about him that gave him power. A soft heart and a sensitive spirit. And an integrity in him that allowed other people to see him and go, I trust you. You live your life in a different way. Run my house, run my prison run my country. 
he was successful the whole time. He just looked a little different. I don't even think he wanted to work for Pharaoh. I wouldn't. The baker worked for Pharaoh. The baker got his head cut off, his body impaled, his head put on a stick, and the birds ate his flesh. Who knows why? I don't want to work for a boss like that. I would have asked Pharaoh, do you have a wife? Because I've had bad luck with wives, not my own, other people's who accuse me of stuff I didn't do. And I don't want to, I mean, there, I would have reservations. I would, I'd be careful. But what did he do? He did what was right, what was next, what God had put in front of him. And he was the same when he was a slave as he was when he was second in command of the nation, the country of Egypt. That's successful, friends. It's about what's in here, not what's out there. Now, God often gives resources to people. And when he does, it's always a test, isn't it? But if it wasn't for people who God has trusted resources with or within or in, however you say that, God's work couldn't be done. Ministries couldn't be done. Churches couldn't thrive. So certainly resources aren't the enemy, but it's our pursuit of, our worship of, our being imprisoned by, us serving anything other than the Lord. There's something about Joseph. There's something I want. I want to be like that. Before the years of famine, two sons were born to Joseph by his wife, who was, well, she was the, the daughter of a priest to a false god. I had somebody ask if she was good looking. I said, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't matter. She was assigned to him. It didn't matter, right? So if you're wondering that, I don't know. I'm not sure why they asked. It's just an interesting question. They did make it better if you were married to a, a, a priest's daughter. I don't know. But they had two kids. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh. And he said, it's because God has made me forget all of my trouble and all my father's household. The second son, he named Ephraim. And he said, it's because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Let me show you two things. God made Joseph forget his trouble. And when I say forget, it doesn't mean like literally his mind was wiped and he couldn't remember the details of his past. And he literally just had a blank spot in his consciousness. This is what it means, and this is what God will do for you and what he will do for me if we choose to step out and live in uncommon faith. He will take the sting, the pain, the power of the worst things that have happened to you in your past, and he will remove them so that it no longer controls you. For some, we live our whole lives running from an event or events in the past. Listen to this. This is really important. For some, our whole identity is running from the past. We're driven from the past. And this story teaches us that God will free you from having to be driven by the events of your past and you can be driven toward the events of the future that God has called you to. Do you understand what I'm saying? That he, that he frees you from the pull from the power, from the grasp that so many of us have allowed to trap us in an event or to a person, to a situation that happened years ago. And if Joseph didn't have a right to be trapped, then nobody does. But God made him forget. The second one I kind of like, because we talked last week about this and the week before. Sometimes, not all the time, we're in places we don't want to be with people we don't want to be around doing stuff we don't want to do. Right? That just, that's just part of life sometimes. You know what? God made him useful even though he suffered. Useful by God's definition. Fruitful. Successful. May I remind you because he was accountable, because he had humility, and because he had integrity, 
But this is what God did for him, and this is what God wants to do for us, for you and for me. All right, let's move on. We gotta run out of time here. A person who reacts to their own success. A person who reacts to their own success believes that they deserve it. They ignore all of the work that God did behind the scenes. They deserve it. They can do with their lives whatever they wish. This person thinks they're doing God a favor by throwing a few bucks God's way, by showing up to church every once in a while, by serving from time to time. I'm doing you a favor, God. I'm a busy person. I've accumulated a lot. I'm doing a lot. I'm very successful. You should be lucky to have me on your team. That's the kind of person that just simply reacts to success. And Jesus goes, this person's misinformed. They're playing by the wrong rules. They're playing the wrong game. They're missing what's really important. There's a point. Jesus calls this person foolish, a person who responds. To success acknowledges that God gave them. God gave me experiences, ability, opportunity, and even the timing for success. Can I say it a different way that connects the first story and the second story and your story? God controls the seasons in your life and all of the ingredients that make up the seasons. This person believes that their time, their relationships, and their resources belong to God and God alone. This is a person of accountability, of humility, and of integrity. This is a person of uncommon faith. All right, a couple closing thoughts. When I become successful, God, I'll honor you, says the fool. Bless me, God, give me what I want. Let me accomplish my goals. And then after, after I graduate, after I'm married, after I get a promotion, after I hit a certain dollar amount, after I retire, after I, then I'll honor you, God. Give me what I want. And then I'll tip you, God. Give me what I want. And you'll be so lucky to have me on your team, God, you won't even know what to do. That's the fool. While I become successful, whether I'm in the pit or second in command, I will honor God. That's uncommon faith, friends. What is your responsibility to God? And what are you doing today to be part of his plan? We're gonna follow up next week. I can't wait. I want you to be here. Father, thank you for my friends.